Farm Week is a production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, farm program payments are expected to be the highest in 10 years due to the decline in farm prices. Mississippi residents are learning about the cultural and spiritual aspects of Japanese floral design. In the food factor, sweet potatoes. They're nutritious and will have some new ways to cook them. In Southern Gardening, Columbine, it's hardy and it grows in a variety of climates. In the markets, the cotton trade ponders what China's long-awaited plans may mean, as analysts fret that part of the cattle sector can't do what it's supposed to. In the feature segment today, this Oklahoma greenhouse operation uses aeroponic towers to grow leafy greens faster and with less water. You know, we tasted the product, it was beautiful, and immediately we took it on. Good day everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Artis Ford, welcome to Farm Week. Some agricultural economists are predicting that farm program payments may be at the highest point in 10 years this year. Artis, the prediction comes from the Food and Policy Research Institute at the University of Missouri. The 2016 increase is due to the decline in farm prices, but farmers shouldn't expect farm program payments to be this high in the future. Fapri told brownfield.com that payments will be high because a lot of farmers signed up under the ARC, or Agriculture Risk Coverage Program, in the Farm Bill. FAPRI says this is good for farm income, but ARC payments are expected to drop off in the future. ARC uses moving averages to calculate payments. The high prices of recent years won't be used in the calculations starting in 2017. FAPRI expects ARC payments to drop sharply. FAPRI says crop insurance will be the single most important part of the farm safety net in the coming years if commodity prices stay low. The art of Japanese floral arrangement is more than simply putting flowers in a container. It's a disciplined art form steeped in the philosophy of developing a closeness with nature. Japanese floral design is one of the workshops offered by the floral design program of Mississippi State University Extension. Farm Week's Amy Taylor Myers reports from Biloxi. In Japanese culture, floral design is a highly regarded art form, holding the same prominence as painting and sculpting. Mississippi State University Extension horticulturist Dr. James Del Prince explains what the workshop covered. In Ikebana, there are different rules and different schools that develop the rules so that the floral design has a particular look, a particular visual balance. Certainly in Ikebana, they take on a more spiritual feeling and they're quite symbolic of the life of humans. I developed this idea because I wanted to make flowers and Japanese culture aware to our local community. Uh, we have a wonderful resource with Chieko Awata here as the artist in residence for the School of Human Sciences of Mississippi State University. I wanted to bring her to the coast uh, to offer this uh, ceremony. Usually it has meal and sake, rice wine, and then tea ceremony is, is all included uh, called chaji. This is a thin powdered, thin green tea called matcha. For Japanese green tea ceremony, we only use matcha. Mississippi State University Extension is offering more floral design workshops throughout the year. From the Coastal Research and Extension Center, I'm Amy Taylor Myers reporting. Most people recognize sweet potatoes, but most people don't know that they are an excellent source of vitamins A and C. In this week's episode of The Food Factor, Natasha Haynes with Mississippi State University Extension shows us how versatile sweet potatoes can be.
Here on The Food Factor, we love to take popular foods and discover creative and healthy ways to enjoy them. And no food has proven itself more diverse than the sweet potato. Sweet potatoes truly can be prepared in a variety of ways and make for a healthy substitute. For instance, try slicing up some sweet potatoes. Toss them in olive oil, salt, and cayenne pepper and bake in the oven for a nutritious alternative to french fries. The natural sugars of sweet potatoes paired with the peppery zing of cayenne are a combination your taste buds will thank you for. Another idea is to take roasted sweet potato cubes and mix with kale, quinoa, and black olives for an imaginative salad creation bursting with vibrant colors and flavor. The diversity of sweet potatoes can fit the bill for just about any meal opportunity, from breakfast foods to dinner size to classic desserts. Regardless of how you enjoy eating your sweet potato, you'll be getting a power punch of vitamins and fiber in every delicious bite. It's time to make healthy food a factor in your life. Mississippi is the nation's second largest producer of sweet potatoes. The state's farmers are expected to plant 25,000 acres this year. Spring plants need to be hardy because you never know when a late cold spell might occur. In this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman with Mississippi State University Extension tells us about the colorful and unique columbine. one of my favorite spring plants with their interesting flowers and make the perfect addition to any garden and landscape. Columbine are fascinating plants. The foliage is reminiscent of maidenhair fern, but the flowers are the main attraction. The flowers are suspended on thin wiry stems and either turn up or nod down. A notable feature of the columbine flower are the spurs attached to each of the five petals. These spurs resemble an eagle's claw, for which the Latin translation is aquila, which is related to the columbine genus name aquilegia. These spurs are thrust backward and create a counterbalance that allow the flowers to nod and bob with the slightest breeze as if floating on water. These swan series columbine flowers are an interesting landscape addition. The yellow is bright and cheery, but I like the bicolors of red and white, blue and white, and pink and yellow. Though these plants look fragile, they are really tolerant of many environments. Planted in full or partial shade, columbine will thrive and flower profusely. This plant likes good loamy to gravelly soil, and a rock garden is a favorite. In North Mississippi, they are perennial, while in the coastal counties, Columbine should be used as spring annual color. Not only do columbine add beauty and interest to the landscape, they also attract wildlife. The colorful spurs are filled with sweet nectar and are magnets for hummingbirds and butterflies. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman for Southern Gardening. Leighton columbine is grown through zones three through nine, so it has a very wide range. It's also deer resistant. In our feature segment today, see how this greenhouse operation uses towers to grow its leafy plants to maturity all year long. Time now for the markets with Leighton. You say there's a lot of chatter in the cotton trade? That's right, Artist China finally gives some details of its long anticipated reserve sales. Also ahead this week, U.S. farm raised catfish prices tick up. Fed cattle disappoint traders as a red flag appears in the beef market. And soybean producers are cautioned to remember sales and manage their risk. We lead the markets with the latest snapshot of the U.S. farm raised catfish industry. This was released April 15th. It reflects the market during the month of March. U.S. catfish producers received an average price of $1.15 per pound for premium size live fish in March. That is up three cents from February and up a penny a pound from one year ago. Now, farm sales topped 30 million pounds round weight, an increase of 2% from March 2015. Processor sales were over 15 and one half million pounds in March. That's an increase of just over 7% compared to the same period one year ago. 
Weakness marked the April live cattle futures at midweek. Trader Mark Gold has spotted what he calls a red flag in this sector, one that has him wanting to protect the downside. While he is hoping demand is building as the U.S. gets more into grilling season, he and some other analysts are by no means sure at this point. One would think so, but what bothers me about this cattle market is I've been saying for the last year, basically, if you want to know where the cattle market's going to go, watch the stock market. Stock market's within 350 points of its all-time highs, and we haven't been able to rally this beef market, which is a bit concerning to me out here. And the struggle has been higher demand versus higher output, not only in the numbers of animals, but in the weights as well, in the tonnage that's out there. So right now we're losing that battle and price has been moving a little bit lower. It's not critical yet, but considering when a market can't do what it's supposed to do, it's certainly a red flag to me. And would I be owning put options? I would be because we can't see what's happening. Well, time to check out our trivia quiz for this week on Farm Week. And this week it is about the bee business. Here's the quiz question. What was the average honey yield per colony in the state of Mississippi in 2015? Is the answer 49 pounds, 65 pounds, 83 pounds, or 112 pounds of honey? Stay with us for the answer. We're going to pause for a short break on Farm Week. Coming up, we'll look at the calendar and the rest of the markets. Slayton Span says that China's cotton continues to cast a shadow on the world market. Ground is broken for a new sawmill at Newton, Mississippi. In the feature segment today, growing plants year-round without soil using vertical towers. They say this is the information age, where people can instantly find any answers they're looking for. Yet, so many of us still can't figure out how to feel better. Well, here's a suggestion. Eat better. And what better place than a Mississippi farmer's market to help you do just that? Locally grown fruits and vegetables are healthy, picked at the peak of quality and freshness to help you feel better. Before we get back to the markets, let's look at the Farm Week calendar. If you're interested in alfalfa hay production, there will be a demonstration field day on Thursday, May 19th. The location is the Coastal Plain Branch Experiment Station on Coastal Plain Road, east of Newton. The hours are 9 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. Learn how to grow alfalfa and see a demonstration of baleage equipment. Please pre-register by Friday, May 13th. The Beef and Forge Field Day will be Saturday, May 21st. That's at Tylertown. It will take place at the Livestock Producers Sale Barn on Highway 98, east of Tylertown. It starts at 8.45 a.m. New vaccination regulations and low-stress animal handling will be on the agenda. The top performing bulls from the South Mississippi Gain on Forge bull test will be on display, and these bulls will be available for sale. There's no registration fee, but you are asked to pre-register for lunch. Go to our Farm Week website at farmweek.msucares.com for information on these and other events. Now check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. China is now officially confirming when and how sales of its massive reserve stocks of cotton will take place. The so-called 900-pound gorilla in the cotton market is no longer as much of a mystery as Extension Ag economist Brian Williams explained to me. Well, Brian, I'd like to begin by asking you to elaborate more on China's announcement about cotton. Well, they, they did make a, a big announcement last week. Uh, the, the main thing about it is that they, they've announced that they're going to um, Try to auction off an additional uh, two million bale or two million tons of cotton um, in May through uh, August. Now, how has this impacted the market so far in prices, or has it at all? Well, you would think that you know, with more cotton hitting the market, that would have a negative impact, but it really hasn't. Um, and and the whole key to this is that they they have said that they're going to auction off their highest quality cotton. 
and a lot of them and a lot of traders in the market have taken that as kind of a hint that maybe that means they don't have a whole lot of high quality cotton and the rest of it is stuff that's been sitting in, in storage for years and it's lower quality. Now you mentioned high quality cotton, was there not also some mention uh, that China wants to purchase additional high quality cotton, meaning importing some cotton? Right, and that kind of reaffirms the, the suspicions that maybe there's, there's a lot of poor quality cotton in storage. And here in the U.S. that, that really helps us because we produce some of the, the highest quality cotton in the world. And so that, that's a, a good export market for our, our cotton. Hopefully supportive of the market. Yes. Now there was also some news from uh, U.S. Ag Secretary Tom Vilsack about cotton this week. Yeah, he, he has announced that we're going to have a, a special import quota. Um, basically what that is is we're going to import an additional uh, 65,000 bales of cotton, which is one week's worth of use. Um, the reason for that being is that uh, in the Far East, um, U.S. cotton prices are, are higher than the global prices and there's some laws, regulations in place that require them to put this in place to kind of bring those prices back to, to similar levels. It sounds like that's not exactly welcome news as far as uh, cotton merchants and the cotton industry. No, on, on the markets they're not really real thrilled about it and, and that's the whole intention of this is to bring those prices down and, and of course it, it kind of has a negative impact on the markets. Well, we move to soybeans now, and selling some beans is still not a bad idea, maybe even aggressively. This according to analyst Angie Setzer. She is even suggesting that 25 to 30 percent of accepted production should already have been sold at this point. Angie is also worried about what could be a wet blanket falling on this market. It all comes back down to your local, your, your own situation. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I can sit here and say you should be selling and, and you could sit there and say I can't make money at this. Um, but you've got to be aware of your ability to withstand risk, mm -hmm. your ability of having your, your risk managed. Um, because there is a great potential there that we could see um, these soybean acres increase as we go forward um, and, and really kind of put a wet blanket over the market. Right. A brand new sawmill in the state that was first announced back at Christmas time is now officially under construction. Buer Lumber broke ground in Newton on April 13th for the $85 million facility. It will be the company's first operation in the south. Buer has four sawmills in the Midwest and three lumber treating and distribution centers. This new Newton mill will employ 125 people. Well, back to the trivia quiz on Farm Week to wrap things up in the markets for this week. And the correct answer is C. The average honey yield per colony in Mississippi is 83 pounds. Many people have heard of hydroponics. Still others know what aquaponics are. Today on Farm Week, aeroponics. In Oklahoma, there's a serious greenhouse operation using aeroponics to grow leafy greens year round. The owners say their method results in faster plant growth and it uses much less water than in-ground production. The resulting quality is excellent. Market to Market's Paul Yeager explains. The Oklahoma landscape is dominated by oil pumping jacks and cattle. But in one area of Tulsa, a new type of greenhouse has sprung up. Part new business opportunity, part environmentally conscious philosophy Scissor Tail Farms has embarked on a growing movement in the Sooner State. So we realized that there was so much produce coming from the Southwest and it was spending you know, time getting trucked or, or flown out to the markets that it eventually ended up in and we wanted to, uh, you know, we'll, we saw an opportunity there to uh, create something that would be closer to the market and at the end of the day be providing a better, fresher product. At the beginning of the decade, Rob Walenta and John Sultan built a business plan for a local greenhouse and their research led them to an innovative method of production called aeroponics. Being able to provide a fresher, healthier product locally um, and year round, you know, when the market's so volatile in the Southwest based off environmental conditions or you know, worker conditions, we, uh, we have you know, a setup where we can produce consistently throughout the year and offer the same price and the same quality in the middle of winter that we can in the summer. The aeroponic process does not require soil. It's similar to hydroponics, 
in that it relies heavily on nutrient-rich water. Scissortail Farms sprays an enriched mist over the exposed roots. But before any of that can happen, the seeds germinate in a mix of woven volcanic material. Then within this substrate, you can see are individual little cubes. And once these grow to their, their height, we simply break these cubes off. And when they go outside, they fit in each one of the slots in the, the larger towers. Once the plants have been moved, timers control the application of nutrient-enriched water designed for that specific plant. Scissortail Farms estimates that the growing process uses one-tenth of the water it would take to grow the same crop on a conventional farm. Each one of these towers has these rings that interlock, and in the center they form a channel. So that channel runs all the way through from the top to the bottom. And at the base, in the reservoir of each one, is a submersible pump. And that pump sends the water through the channel to the top, where it collects and then it, it drips back down over the roots, uh, roots that are suspended within the tower. Although startup costs were steep, the folks at Scissortail Farms were willing to take the gamble, believing not in only the business itself, but in the support of a growing movement towards locally sourced foods. Local distributors are embracing that trend as well by delivering goods from Scissortail Farms to hospitals, grocery stores, schools, and numerous restaurants. While demand is somewhat elastic, it's not uncommon for the 37,000 square foot facility to produce 800 to 900 cases of leafy greens each week. I mean, that's what uh, John and Robbie try to do, but you know, they try to gauge the, the supply and demand and we try to do the best we can. But, you know, we're still fairly early on, so. Sure. And it's a big place, so we've got lots of room to, to try to make educated guesses. Having only been up and running for nine months, Rob credits the farm's startup success to the friends and family who helped with the initial funding to get the operation off the ground. Uh, you know, we've got 1,368 of these towers, so we've got 62,000 plants growing at any given time just in the production area, and then about that many growing in the prop area as well. So having people here who, you know, know all the aspects of the business and are passionate about it, it's a huge, you know, relief for us to be able to go focus on some other things and know that everything's getting taken care of here. Tall Grass Prairie Table in downtown Tulsa was one of Scissortail Farms' first customers, and the locally sourced restaurant quickly embraced aeroponics. You know, we tasted the product, it was beautiful, and immediately we took it on. Tall Grass Prairie Table is a farm-to-fork restaurant with a menu that is built with 80 to 90 percent local ingredients. The owners work hand-in-hand -hand with local farmers to ensure that products they purchase meet the quality they demand for their customers. For Chef Donaldson, one of the advantages of the product Scissortail Farms brings to the table is the ability for her to be a part of the growing process. I mean, it's a really great feeling because I, I really get to own my plate. Um, I'm not at the mercy of what may or may not be there. So if I do go to Rob and say, hey, this is the size that I want, this is the blend that I want, he's able to put that together. Um, and, you know, it, it comes directly to us. So I, I do have a little bit more control instead of just saying, um, I'll have three cases of spring mix. It takes significantly less time to grow produce aeroponically. And the method's precise control of the environment enables Scissortail Farms to deliver fresh produce year-round. What's amazing about this is if someone comes to us in October and says, hey, you know, I need 200 heads of a particular type of lettuce uh, by January, I say no problem. And so that's what makes this remarkable is when it's snowing outside, when there's a blizzard outside, it's 72 degrees in here and we're growing heads of lettuce and it's fresh, it's picked that day. And you can't do that anywhere else. For Scissortail Farms and its customers, success comes not only from technological advancements, but by working together to accelerate the move to locally grown foods. The relationship that Rob and I have, um, I give him the opportunity to do what he's doing by, um, you know, giving his business money, and he gives me the opportunity to do what I'm doing 
um, by allowing me to take control of what I'm putting on my plate. And so it's a sustainable relationship between the two of us. Um, it, it helps both of us monetarily, but it also helps us focus on um, a shared vision. For Market to Market, I'm Paul Yeager. You can watch this story again on Scissor Tail Farms on our Farm Week website, farmweek.msucares.com. You can also watch Farm Week stories on our Farm Week USA Facebook page and YouTube. We'll also have a link to the Market to Market site where you can uh, see the original story as well as read the script. We're also available at twitter.com slash farmweek. Scissor Tail Farms has a Facebook site and a website. Well, we are at the end of Farm Week for this week. On our next show, social media is the start of a lot of true and false stories about food. And there's been a lot of social media buzz about a brand of California tangerines grown with recovered oil field water. We'll show you how it's done. In the food factor, speed shopping. The less time you spend in the store, the less you'll spend on food. And in southern gardening, weird plants. These plants are unusual, but they're still beautiful and edible. If you'd like further information on a Farm Week story or you want to suggest a story to us, you need to get in touch. You can also find us on Facebook and YouTube. Our mailing address, Farm Week Box 9625, Mississippi State, Mississippi 39762. You can also contact us through your county office of Mississippi State University Extension. For the rest of the Farm Week crew, I'm Artis Ford. And I'm Leighton Spann. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.